The Cincinnati Reds trade deadline has raised some new concerns about whether or not the front office can deliver what they told us, sustainable success. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked on Reds. We are your daily source for all things Cincinnati Reds. I'm Stephen Offenbaker. That guy over there, he is Jeff Carr. And we have a combined 12 years of experience covering the Cincinnati Reds in podcasting form. We love baseball. We love these Reds. We have taken our love for the game, our love for this team that never loves us back. And we've turned that into information for you. Locked on Reds is part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every single day. All right. I'm seeing in the comment section that I am coming through soft. Jeff, you were right about that. They're already telling me to bring it up a bit. Um, a bit I just bumped yeah. my numbers. We'll see how we do. Um, comment section. Let me know if that's better. Uh, on today's show, we're going to be getting into do we trust this front office or not? We've heard plans before. They've fallen on their face. We've heard from Nick Crawl. He told us what he said we were going to do as a team. Um, now the question is, do we trust him to get it done? We're going to be looking at Ellie De La Cruz today, gang, because maybe it's time to just accept the fact that Ellie is great and we just need to let Ellie be Ellie. We're going to be talking about Ellie. We're also going to be talking about a San Francisco series at Great American Ballpark that really is the start of the Reds. Are they going to do it wild card postseason push? Uh, they are directly behind the Giants in the in the standings. Uh, last time I looked yesterday, we were off. I didn't see what the Giants did yesterday. But it, they're, they're right there, neck and neck. Five games, five and a half games. This is where it starts, folks. We're going to be getting into that. And, of course, we are live, so we're going to be taking your questions and comments on today's show, which is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As the playoffs wind down and sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this is summer, so FanDuel is always hooking up customers. They've got a bonus or a boost, something for you every single day. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. To get started. Jeff, my whole system is freaking out. Is is do I, is this okay? Do I sound all right? Am I? Yeah, it, it's weird because it's like it's been like super light, and then I think I got it. I think I have it right now. You should be good. I, all right. Hopefully, we're here. I don't want to have a seven minute mute uh, experience like you had last time. Yeah, it's good that you read live. the comments section. It's good that you pay attention to that. <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's get into this, Jeff. Let's start with the front office because. The, the trade deadline fell flat. You and I agreed on that. We both gave it a rating of meh. Um, yeah. The the deals that they did make are okay, whatever. They're not needle movers. One way or another, I don't think, in the grand scheme of things. But here we are. We're, we're left once again asking ourselves, do we trust this front office to lead the team to the promised land? I, I think the biggest thing for me, Steve, is that – they just continue to make these moves that are, well, if it works out, they look like geniuses, but if they don't, then it's a very low risk move. That seems to be the only thing that they're married to. And whether or not it's a budget constraint, I don't think that's an issue. Like the trade deadline, they had, they should have had some room. Cause it wasn't as if they were going, yeah, Phil's messing with your audio. It wasn't as if they went like crazy in the off season and spent a ton of money. Like we, we have looked at this before. I've looked at this before. They are still well below the league average payroll when it comes to, you know, what they're paying for on the field right now. And they got rid of Frankie Montas's contract. I really feel like this team had some sort of financial flexibility to go. So for as much as we want to say, well, ownership got in the way and told him he couldn't spend any money. I don't know how that's possible because he actually saved money by trading Frankie Montas and they got cash back in that deal. So that's out the door. So the question for me is, is this the only move that, and you know, trading for prospects, are those the only moves that he can do? Because we haven't seen them go get a consistent, everyday major league contributor that moves the needle and makes you think, okay, this team is serious and they're ready to go to the postseason and make some noise. Yeah. I, I don't know that Cincinnati knows how to buy at the deadline. They've never, they, this current iteration of the front office, uh, Nick crawl, he's not had to do that. You know, his success story is Sam Mull. That's, that's his big get. And, right. and, and I think you're right. I don't know. I don't know if that's a Nick crawl problem. Or is that a Castellini problem? 
because mm. Nick can only do what he's allowed to do. He can only go spend what he's allowed to spend. So uh, his off seasons, you know, we rated him fairly highly on his off seasons mm. based on the moves he was able to make with the budget that he had. Um, at some point, though, you have to be able to, you know, think on your feet's not the right term, but adjust on the fly, right? You have to make a move right. on the fly. And if if the front if the ownership group is not going to let the baseball front office baseball when it needs to, this is about as good as it's ever going to get. 500 teams yeah. that may or may not squeak into the postseason, um, and and that's simply not good enough. That is that is not to quote Bob Castellini bringing championship baseball to the city of Cincinnati. That's not going to get it done. So. You know, there's all these PR moves afoot right now, Jeff. Right. Phil Castellini is the new CEO. Um, it's 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 a bright, sunshiny day in the Queen City, and we are promoting people. So, you know, the question is, what does that mean for Nick Crawl? What does that mean for the flexibility? You know, has this been a Bob problem? Has having to run everything through Bob still been the biggest part of the problem? Maybe so. What will things look like if Phil can just say yes or no? I'm going to be interested to see how things play out between now and the off season and into the off season. If Nick crawl seems to be a little more freewheeling because that would be, that would be a big deal. Yeah. In the prepared statement that Bob Castellini made in the promotion announcement of Phil Castellini, he said that, you know, they've done great work and I'm not really sure what constitutes great work. I'm not really sure where the check boxes are. And I'm not really sure why this is the first time that we've heard from Bob Castellini this entire year. I know that you had mentioned you saw him at a ball game and he didn't look all that great. So that could be the reason why, but mm -hmm. on, on the whole, like all we've heard about this team are narratives and plans and, and, and headlines. And, and quite frankly, you and I bought into those a lot over the last calendar year or so, but this deadline constitutes more questions that do not prove their narratives correct. In fact, I feel like they add weight to them. They add pressure to them mm -hmm. and they're not helping themselves out. The, the Frankie Montas signing this off season, we were, we, we were standing on a table saying they need a top flight starting pitcher, or at least somebody that can go into the middle of your rotation. And they signed Frankie Montas, who hadn't thrown more than two innings over the last year and a half because of shoulder surgery. Okay, so it's a prove-it deal. Let's see what he can do, see if he can get it back. They signed Jamer Candelario, who really, in the grand scheme of things, helped out the depth of the team, but he wasn't a needle mover. And then in this deadline, they flip Montas because the experiment wasn't working out with him. But they get back another experimental player in Joey Weimer. What kind of project is he going to turn it? You know, what what's going to happen out of this project? And then Jacob Junis, I think, is just to stabilize the pitching staff for the rest of this season. And Ty France is uh, he's even more of a lottery ticket, I think, than Joey Weimer is because he's not going to be here much past. I don't think he has more than just this year of team control. So, what are you really going to get? out of what the Reds got, I feel like it's just more of the same of mm -hmm. hope that they're, they're hoping something works out. So, well, you know, Ty France band aid. They, the, for, this was another front office band aid mood, right? Cause they're expecting CES for next year. And we don't know what that's going to look like because you know, he was playing hurt all year. So right. yeah, I don't, I don't worry about, I don't worry about the off season so much, Jeff. I don't worry about what crawl might be able to do. He's going to take, you know, we know that he's going to have a budget and it's going to be very similar to what it was this year, which means knowing what's come off the books, we kind of already know what he's going to have to spend. So he can go out and get a pitcher. He can go out and get God. He can go out and get a right-handed outfield power bat. It can be done. It can happen. We know that it can happen. The, the money They're is there. there. The, the money is there. So, I trust him to do that in the off season. I, I just, when you, when you posed this question of, you know, can we trust the front office and can we trust the front office with a winning team that needs a piece at the deadline to go out and buy? I, you know, right now, Jeff, I'm going to say, no, we can't trust them to do on, anything man. in season. I think, I think this is going to be a, a, a front office that has to build in the off season and hope they get it right. And that, that feels like what this has been, right? Like they did some stuff in the off season. And then whenever it didn't work, their reaction to that was, oh, well, 
We tried. That's baseball. Oh, They're like, that's baseball. We tried. That's baseball. That's baseball. You know, <laughs> some guys get hurt. Oh, boy. You know, like, no, that's your job. When guys get hurt, your job to go make sure the team still functions. And, you know, maybe Ty France. I did look up Ty France. He does have a year of control next season. So they did get him for multiple years. But, again, he's still a lottery ticket. Like, that. All that's, that, that's all this was, was lottery tickets. And mm-hmm. the Reds are moving into a season now, and they're moving into an era now where they should not be relying on lottery tickets. They should be filling in holes and building around key players like our man, Ellie De La Cruz. Oh, man, our man, Ellie De La Cruz. God, we love that guy. So let's talk about Ellie De La Cruz. Should Ellie De La Cruz be finally accepted as the all everything that we think he's going to be? Is he there? How do we rate him right now as a potential star of the Cincinnati Reds? We're going to talk about all of that coming up next. We are past the trade deadline, which means that we're kind of inching toward the stretch run of the playoffs in the baseball season. And FanDuel is a great way to take advantage of these important games. FanDuel has so many great promos all throughout the rest of baseball season as we lead up to summer. Some great boosts as well, like same game parlay boosts that help you increase your payout. Plus, they've also got an interesting thing. I was looking at this on FanDuel. They have the Reds total wins for the season now updated the over under is at 77 and a half so you know if they finish with 78 wins you hit the over i still think they're going to do that i still think i'm taking the over on this maybe you're against that i i don't know but you can check it out over at fandle they've got that bet and so much more the reds are actually underdogs tonight blake snell on the mound former nl Cy young winner we'll see what the reds can do against him in the lineup side of things but you can get in on all the action over at fandle check them out today at fandle.com and add a big win to your summer bucket list fandle is america's number one sports book and get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trades, supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining SupplyHouse.com's free Trade Master program. Every Trade Master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping, and discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at SupplyHouse.com slash TM. And order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at SupplyHouse.com. If you haven't had a chance to do so, you have got to check out Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 streaming sports channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories in sports. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinion, and news from our national hosts as well as the local experts like Jeff and I. Uh, It streams 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Jeff, uh, our guy, Ellie. I think you and I both agree he's a superstar. You and I agree that Major League Baseball is trying to make him a face of the sport, not just Mm -hmm. Cincinnati making him a face of the franchise, but he's come under fire lately. Um, There are some mounting criticism, a a rumble that is building a little bit. At least it's big enough now that we're going to talk about it, where people want to rein Ellie in a little bit. So the question is, should Ellie have the green light to be Ellie whenever he feels like it? Or do they need to put some constraints on him and control when he steals and when he's going to go and when he's going to do the things that he does? Because we saw him get thrown out at third base the other night in a situation where he probably should not have been going and and you right. can't afford to give away that out there. Um, and that is kind of what put people over the edge. W- what do you do with Ellie? I give him the green light. Every dayers will be shocked to hear me say that because Ellie is one of one 
And I get it. He has been thrown out. He is not perfect. In fact, if you look at Baseball Savant, our, one of our favorite websites to go to for baseball information, they have this statistic on base running, the safe per attempt. So every time you attempt to advance a base, are you safe? or are you out? And he's actually kind of low on the list as far as percentage there, 91% as opposed to some of the top base runners in the league, like Corbin Carroll, who's at a hundred percent. You have jazz Chisholm. That's at a hundred percent. You have Anthony Volpe. That's at a hundred percent, a bunch of guys that we all think that when you compare them all to Ellie, Ellie is up there, if not better than these guys. So it's, it's just a matter of the fact that whenever he gets thrown out, people seem to believe that that is the story on him, but he still is above uh, league average in base running value. He has two runner runs. It's a statistic that baseball savant uses to determine, you know, ba advancing bases, maybe taking extra bases whenever the, whenever the math says you probably shouldn't. Um, he still is above average in that it's not as if he is a negative to what the reds are doing. So overall, the positives that he brings outweighs the negatives that we see. And quite frankly, we as reds fans, we as Cincinnati sports fans tend to skew toward the negative side. So when we see him get out like this, we're just like, well, he's got to stop. He's got to stop doing this sort of stuff. But Ellie on the whole has been much better than the negative on that weird steal attempt would show you Ellie's going to run and Ellie should run. Yeah. You know, everybody's really happy when he gets one of his major league baseball leading 55 steals. Everyone loves that. And, and I've said from the beginning with this, Jeff, if they're going to be a running team and you get excited about the stolen bases and you like that, then you're going to have to be accepting of the times they get thrown out. It's going to happen. Um, I want Ellie to be Ellie. I want Ellie to run. I think I do want him to become, and this will come with time. He's very young, guys. He, he's very young major leaguer. I do want him to be a little bit more situationally aware. I do want him to not feel like he has to just do something because nobody else is doing something. Do, do, do you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at right. here, Jeff? I don't yeah. want him to, to, to try and steal third base because by God, that's the only way I'm going to get there kind of mentality. It, right. He needs to be smart about these things and not run the reds out of innings. And we've seen him run the reds out of innings a couple times. And I think that will get better. I think he will learn. I, I want him to continue to be aggressive. So I am accepting of the times he gets thrown out. If, each time he gets thrown out, he learns something and and learns a better way to do it next time. And, and I mean, you think about the number of times he stole bases, Jeff. He's gone 65 times and he's been safe 55 out of the 65 times. So right. I, I like that ratio. I, I think he's doing a good job. And there's even more than that. Like I, I saw that John boy, and this was earlier on in the season, who knows how many more he's added, but John boy did a breakdown of every steal attempt that he has, including ones that were negated by foul balls or ones that were negated by ball fours or like different things where the steal attempt was erased because of the play that happened on the field. He has gone so many times and sure you're going to get thrown out. Like if he was a perfect base stealer, he would be the MVP. Like if you could steal mm -hmm. as many bases as he could and never be thrown out, he would be the MVP and he'd be the first guy that we would ever have said is the MVP because of his base running outweighing everything else that he does. Yeah. Yes. Good old shirt. Still, still holding around there. Appreciate the comment on the shirt there. You know, my, my style, it's a, it's a good it doesn't style. Exist. Um, Your style yeah, doesn't exist. Style. Um, but no, Not I, I ordered really, from stitch fit. And I just think that, yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I just think that we tend to be so critical of him because he is this team star, because he is the, you know, they're building him up to be the face of the league. So when he fails, we feel as though that should not happen. He should never fail because he is a superhuman being. He isn't, you know, not from this world. He's supernatural or something like that, but he is still human. So every so often he might fail a little bit, but I want him to have the green light and go for it every single time. I agree. I, I think that he should he should continue to be him um, and just learn when he makes a mistake. And, and I think he will. I mean, listen, 
you and I talked about this. I don't know if we've talked about it on there, but we've talked about it. How impressed we are with just how smart he is. I mean, in yeah. one off season, he went and learned English guys that, that, and anybody that's learned English as a second language will tell you English is one of the hardest, most confounding languages to pick up just because we do things so weird. So for him to pull that off in an off season, he clearly, he has the brain power to do this. And I do not doubt that he is going to continue to learn from being thrown out and, and become a little bit more situationally aware and, and really make this team better. Uh, before we get out of this segment, Jeff, we're going to move into the, the Q and a, we're going to move into uh, the, ba the best part of the show, uh, which is hearing from the viewers and hearing from the listeners. Uh, Joseph Gaditza dropped this in the comment section. And, you know, you and I have been talking about this a lot and we've been talking about uh, what, what we like about doing this show and what we like about this, this group of people that we get to talk Reds baseball with. And Joseph kind of encapsulated it here. And I just want to roll with this. He says, you know, being out on my own Reds Island here in the Canadian Prairie, Jeff, Steve, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your content along with Riverfront late night. Those guys over there are great as well. He says, I belong to a Reds family. That's how we yeah. want you guys to feel. We appreciate you being here. While I've got a second and your attention, click the like button, click the notification bell, click the thing, subscribe to the audio feeds, take us in the car, take us to the gym, take us on a walk, take us with you. We love talking Reds baseball with you. Share it with your friends. We want to talk Reds baseball with them as well. And coming up, we're going to talk about this series with the San Francisco Giants that means a little bit. And we're going to be taking your questions and comments. And we're doing all of that next. Summertime means outdoor activities and fun in the sun, but don't forget to stay hydrated. Liquid IV will keep you in the game all day long. Liquid IV came in clutch for me on the golf course my last time out. I was shocked to find out that when you drink a Liquid IV, it hydrates you just as well as two bottles of water. So now I always make sure that it's in my bag. And they, leave, they have some awesome flavors for you to check out as well. This summer, they've got the Popsicle Firecracker flavor that mixes a lot of the great summer citrus that you love into a hydrating glass of water. Or you can keep a classic with lemon lime. I don't hit the links without Liquid IV. Keep the cramps away on the course with Liquid IV. Hydration is key to a healthy Happy summer. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order. When you shop Better Hydration today using the promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. You can catch every pitch of the Reds Hometown broadcast with Sirius XM. Just download the SXM app and search the word Reds, and you can take them everywhere. You don't have to worry about how close you are to Cincinnati or anything like that. Sirius XM has you covered. Just search Reds. Also, for some great written content about your Cincinnati Reds, check out CincinnatiRedsTalk.com. Brought to you by Sports Illustrated and all that good stuff. James Rapine's over there. I'm over there. Greg Kuffner at Reds Daily on Twitter is over there as well, giving you some great written content about your Cincinnati Reds. And let's move into the question and answer, uh, our Q&A portion here, Steve. And I kind of want to start first uh, with the Lockdown Reds Insiders. Got a great group of folks, the Lockdown Reds Insiders. If you want to join, just text INSIDER to 513-594-0. The link's in the description of this episode. I'll remember the number a little bit later on. 593, yeah. Anyway. Well, we're on. We're five, having a banner day around here, Jeffrey. 5970944. That's what it was. Um, <laughs> but the first question actually comes from our friend Josh Rosowskis. He says, I'd like to hear you guys talk about whether or not you think that Julian Aguilar or Rhett Lauder should go ahead and be called up now. With the Frankie Montas trade and Graham Ashcraft pretty much looking like he's not going to be coming back this season, it seems like why not call them up and see what they got a little bit earlier than planned. Maybe Brandon Williamson is looking less and less likely that he'll be back for this year. I think unless I'm hearing something wrong, I said, call one of them up or maybe both of them before this year is over and just see where it takes you. I actually am more so on Julian Aguiar than I am on Rhett Louder. Now Rhett Louder has been dominant and Josh, I appreciate you sending the question over there. Um, Brett ladder has been dominant here recently in double a, 
but I think that the Reds plan with him was always going to be 2025. And while I don't mind pushing up that deadline slightly, I still would like him to continue to progress at a very regular rate. Julian Aguiar, on the other hand, is in AAA, has pitched well this season after pitching well enough last season to get the minor league pitcher of the year for the Reds organization. And I really would like to see him. Plus, he has got a tailor-made MLB debut opportunity coming up. Because these three games against the Giants are going to be tough here in Great American. The next four games are in Miami. And Miami traded just about every single player on their roster at the deadline. And and, and there's not going to be anybody there at that ballpark. You're going to have a nice little way to ease Julian Aguiar into his Major League career. I'd love to see him get called up next week. Yeah, I agree with you um, on... Most of what you had to say, I, I don't care how well Rhett Lauder's pitching. Do not call him up this year. He needs to get a full year of professional baseball on his arm and under his belt and just mm-hmm. be a pitcher down in the minor leagues. Let him come into spring training. Let him compete in a normal ramp up where he's not going to try and do too much and, and, and see what he can do. Um, to your point about Julian Aguiar, I think he gets called up this year. We're going to see him. Um, whether it's in the next week or so, or if it's in September, we're going to see him uh, in the minors this season. He's five and four with a 3.87 ERA. He started 20 games thrown 104 innings. So you would assume he still has some innings left on his arm for this year. And his whips 1.23, uh, 84 strikeouts on the season, Jeff. I, I think that he has done enough between, as you said, last year being the minor league pitcher of the year and what he's done this year. Uh, I think he's ready to get a look-see, get him a little taste of the majors, get him in the mix so that he can be involved next year and let Rhett Lauder cook a little bit more. Um, I, I agree with the comment. Let's get Lauder up to AAA, let him get a few more innings of work in down in the minors, and he can come in next season and be in competition for the fifth starter on this team. And there's one more question that I have, and we'll jump into our comment section here in just one moment, because this uh, one last question from a Lockdown Reds insider, this is from Chris Weller, um, and this is more up your alley, but he says, the Reds are on their second medical staff in recent years with similar results. Is it really a medical staff incompetence, or are they being overruled by the manager and or the general manager? Regarding misdiagnosis, inaccurate timelines, Is the quantity and severity a Reds only problem or is it commonplace across the league? How can we be confident in the hiring process of the medical staff uh, if they were to just go ahead and replace them this offseason? That's that's a lot of a question. That's a lot of questions. It's an interesting question for sure. It is. So this is what I think, you know, obviously to the point of the question, we don't know exactly what the medical team is telling the team. The medical staff is telling the Reds. We don't know. But what we do know is there are injuries that you have it and it takes X amount of time to heal. Uh, There are injuries that you get. And if you play on it, if you continue to go out there, you have a high likelihood of making it worse. Talk, think about Jonathan India's hamstring. Um, You play on that thing. It's going to get worse when that happened, when it happened, I told Jeff immediately, like shut him down, sit him down. If he goes back out, it's going to be bad. He went back out. It was bad. Um, Here's the thing with the medical staff. They did overhaul a large portion of the medical staff, but you know, Krimchek's still in charge. He's still the, the, the team surgery go-to guy. Uh, mm-hmm. What we are seeing though, is a lot of players seeking second opinions. And when they seek those second opinions, day to day questionable becomes season ending shoulder surgery, Matt McLean. Um, that's what makes me question the medical staff this year. Uh, CES non-injury, became a second opinion doctor looking at the old imaging saying that wrist has been broken the whole time. Those are the things that make me question this medical staff. I feel like what we've seen from the reds and the volume of second opinions and the volume of second opinions, finding the complete opposite of what the team was telling us, which tells me that they're finding the complete opposite of what the team doctors were saying they need to start over. From a credibility standpoint, maybe the medical staff has been just fine, but from a perception credibility standpoint, this off season, I think it's time to overhaul the medical staff. And we know they're all about perception there with the organization. Um, 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that there's an element to it where you could say that, you know, maybe it's coming from the front office or maybe it's coming from David Bell, but I constantly hear reports like, man, David Bell wanted to do this, but was overruled or David Bell thought about this, but that's not the way that they wanted to take it as a group. And I, I still feel like this is a group decision. So I don't necessarily know that we're getting like a stone wall from the front office or from the manager or something like that. I, I think that you're right. It's, it's, it's probably time at least to, to reset the perception of this medical staff and how it's going. But I appreciate the question, Chris. I appreciate that. All right, Jeff, let's dive into this comment section. All right, gang, let's do it like we normally do. If you've got stuff that's back in the comments and you want to talk about it, uh, just type it in again for me so that we don't have to go digging all the way back. But I do want to make mention of the fact that Frankie Montas is on the bump for the Brewers tonight. Uh, thanks to the Happy Hermit for bringing that back up. That also, I think, lines it up where the Reds aren't going to see him if you project that out which is good. I don't want to see him because the most Reds right. Milwaukee would thing pitch. would be for Frankie Montas to throw a no hitter against us. So, I don't um, think, let's see. I don't think the Brewers have an off day next week. So I, 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 I'm happy for Frankie Montas going, getting some playoff baseball. Hopefully his shoulder holds up. I wish him nothing but success unless he's playing the Cincinnati Reds. And then I hope they light him up, but yeah, I think they're going to miss him, I, but I did that math quick. You check that out. Yeah, because even so, they do have an off day on Monday. But even with the off day, that would put Montas Montas in line to pitch next Thursday in Atlanta when the Brewers play the Braves. So he will pitch right before the Reds come to Milwaukee. All right, um, let's go. I did see one. I want to jump in on this one because uh, Luke the catcher had a great comment. Uh, he said, do you think that Tyler Stevenson is locked in as the catcher for the future? I'm happy with his performance this year as a catcher myself. That I appreciate how much better he's gotten at framing. And he has gotten a lot better at framing. I mean, quite frankly, he was horrible uh, last year uh, when it came to that statistic. But I think overall, he has improved his game to where we thought, at least where I thought he would be. I, I thought he would be the catcher number one without a doubt. I thought a lot of folks were jumping ship too early on him, and he's proved that this year. You know, I, I probably I probably am a little bit more of a, a Tyler Stevenson homer than most. I really like that guy um, mm -hmm. just because we've got to talk to him. We've interviewed him. He He's a great dude, and that maybe skews my view of him a little bit and his 40 home run power potential. Leave me alone. Um, I, I, I think that he's the, he's the catcher for now. He's the catcher for this year. He's the catcher for next year. Do the Reds extend him? Do they sign him to a big uh, extension contract? I don't know. Um, I think a lot of that will be determined by what's going on in the low minors right now with the catching prospects. Um, they've drafted a lot of catchers over the last several years, and none of them have really amounted to much. Nobody has really set themselves apart. So we got to wait and see. If two more seasons pass and none of those guys have really established themselves, I don't think they go out and pay big money, free agent money for a catcher, but maybe they find a working deal with Tyler and keep him around a few more extra years. So I know that's a very convoluted way to say he's the catcher for right now. He, he may not be the catcher for the future and he may not be locked in for a long time, uh, but he's here now. Exactly. And there are so many, that, uh, so many more that I want to get to, but real quick, I want to split this right now. This is actually going to be the end of episode one for folks that are watching the replay. Everybody live here, hang on with us. I'm going to, this is going to be like a spot where I kind of drop in an ending to the episode uh, whenever we replay this. Thanks so much for joining us here live. Um, but definitely remember that next week we will be wrapping up this Giants series. I, I want to talk with Ben Kaspik and kind of break down the Giants because we were actually talking here today about what on earth. And because he was asking me, he's like, what on earth? Why are the Reds not better than they are? Well, get in line, Ben. We, we really <laughs> right. got to figure that one out. Um, but yeah, that's definitely going to be coming up later on uh, early next week because we are locked on Reds every single day.